What we're doing tonight, first of all, we started off our Wednesday night service last week, and we had a healing service, and it was a powerful time. And then tonight, of course, we're doing, we're setting up the stage for the prophetic conference. And then next Wednesday, can somebody say next Wednesday? Is going to start the prophetic conference, and the prophetic conference is going to go Wednesday night, and then Thursday. What time's Thursday morning? At 9.30, 9.30, and then Thursday night at 6.30. We're doing 6.30, and then, because we don't go too late because there's school the next day, and then Friday morning at 9.30, and then Friday night, 6.30, and then Saturday morning at 9.30. At I would say 9.30, 9.30, 9.30, and then Sunday morning, of course, we'll end the conference. And so we have some powerful prophetic ministry. One of the things when we, when we do a conference like this is we're investing in the church. We're investing in our young people. Our young people are having a presbytery next week. And uh, on, on Wednesday night, while we're in here... We have Pastor Eric Butler from New Jersey. He's going to be ministering in here. We have the other prophets that are going to be over in the other building ministering to our youth. And we actually have a split time so we can get as many young people as possible ministered to. And so we have our other ministry going to be over there ministering to them. And so we're investing in the house. This is an important time. And this is an important time even for all of us. And I want you to pray about it, about sowing a seed even into those prophetic ministries because the scripture talks about, you know, when you give unto a prophet, you're going to receive a, a prophet's reward. And there's a whole lot of things to teach about what the prophet's reward is, but one of the main things is, is the prophet's reward is fulfillment of the word of the Lord. And so, and so there's something about sowing seeds, so we're going to be doing that during that time, but this is going to be a life-changing moment in the history of this house, Amen. And so we're excited because we have Pastor Eric Butler coming from New Jersey. We have Pastor Jerusha Tanner and her husband Ben, uh, who is a captain of a fire department. He's, they're coming. He's a worship pastor as well. And they're going to be coming from Portland, Oregon. We have Pastor Derek Shepard and his wife Heather. They have five children just like you. Um, but uh, they, they have five kids. But they're going to be coming here as well, Pastor Derek Shepard. And then uh, Dr. Don Costa, who's one of the ones that helped helped us set up uh, Karis Theological Institute, which, by the way, last night was the beginning of live instruction here. Amen. On the grounds. And we had 28 students, live students in the class. And so we'll have more. And if you're interested, if you can't do the live, but you can do online. Taking a class is really simple, by the way. I'm doing a commercial here, but it's okay. Taking a class is really simple. You have, you have it's a, those classes online are 10 hours. They're 10 hours for a class, and they, you have six weeks to finish them. And so you can do them at midnight. You could do it three in the morning or three in the afternoon. It doesn't matter. You have that time frame to finish them, 10 weeks to, I mean, six weeks, I'm sorry, to finish a 10-hour course. And so if you're interested in taking Bible school, talk to our registrar, Lisa Charles, or you can talk to uh, Jackie as well, Sister Jackie, and they can set you up for that. Amen. Also, do you see what we got back here? It's amazing. God blessed us with this. And uh, I mean, when I talk about blessing, th let me tell you a little bit about this. I won't talk about this on Sunday, but um, the a a group called King and Co for King and Country, you ever heard of them? So they were going, they ordered this with a company in Houston for a concert series they were going to do in December, and then everything changed. And so the company whom Pastor Gabe was connected through family to them uh, contacted us and said, we need to basically get rid of this at cost. And so we're talking about, should I say the numbers? <laughs> this, is, this is this, plus also we have in the FLC another, a large screen as well uh, for that room. And they did that. That's all set up as well for our youth because our youth services are going to be in there and other events, different things will take place. Uh, but this was about, this and that was about 210000 And we got a blessing and we got it for a third of the price. And uh, so we were like, one of those things where it's like, if we didn't grab it, somebody else was. And the other thing about it is this, is the, the pixels, this is a high, high resolution. Most churches have about 3.9 milli, milli, what do you call them? Millimeters. 
is that what you call them? Uh, the link, the the distance of the little pixels, and because it's a concert level one, it's actually 2.6, so the resolution is even greater. So some people are sitting there thinking, well, can I watch a Cowboys game in here? Let's not talk about that. But, but what a blessing, and they came in the last couple of days and put all this in. So if we want to be down at the Jordan River while we're preaching, we can, let's go down to the riverside. Amen. Uh, but uh, we're just thankful. But uh, we're going to get into the word here tonight and share um, on the second part, the Prophetic House 2.0. And we're just going to set up the prophetic ministry. Now, one of the things I've been saying to you all is this, is... One of the things that you got when you brought us here <laughs> is a prophetic ministry. And I've been known, my family has been known for multiple generations as doing prophetic ministry across the world uh, for decades and decades. For over for six, seven decades, our family has been involved in prophetic ministry. And so one of the things that's very important to us, though, is context with prophetic. And we'll get into this a little bit tonight. But... I grew up in a prophetic environment. We were in a church, and Pastor Nick and Latoya, they were, they were with us in Oakland for a while. And, I mean, there was 50 people in the church, at least, that could stand up and prophesy the word of the Lord. There was like a school of prophets, which I can see developing here. God's, there's prophetic people in this room. And you might not have defined it yet, but we're going to begin to define that and see what, that, what God has. But when I was born... And I'll start with this, and then we're going to hand out some notes. But I don't hand out notes to people before we need them because people like to, 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 to peruse them in advance. And I just want you just to just, just be able to just follow along, okay? So, but uh, I've just learned that. But um, when I was born, I was born with a disease called Highlands Membrane. And my, basically, my lungs were premature. And it was the same disease that Patrick Kennedy, JFK, their son, passed away of 10 years before I was born. And he, he died, and they had the best doctors in the world. And so I had this, this in my body, and I was hooked up to life support and, uh, for 11 days. And the morning of the 11th day, the doctor called my father and said, we don't see any improvement, and we don't think your son's going to make it. And so our recommendation is, and it was you know $11,000 a day in 1973 is a lot of money without insurance. And, uh, and so, you know, the bills were piling up. And he said, we don't think he's going to make it anyway, so you need to consider today turning off the machines. And uh, so, you know, he got that word. And then the, a prophet from Los Angeles, from Long Beach, California. Anyone from Long Beach here? Oh, Long Beach, that's right. Long Beach, California called, his name was David Schock, and David Schock was a powerful man of God. Um, when he preached on the blood, I mean, literally the power would go off in buildings. When he preached on the blood, he had a, had a real revelation on the blood of, the, of Jesus and the cross, and he'd preach, and, and people would just get healed in the room, and people would just cry out. It was like a, like almost like Charles Finney type thing where people just start crying out in the middle of the services and running to the altars. And he was just five, ten minutes into the sermon, but he had this, this encounter in God. And so he was a strong prophetic voice known all over the world. Um, he actually lived in Fort Worth uh, before he passed away, uh, but he, but he moved, had moved there. But he called my father a couple hours after the doctor called, and he just didn't even say hello. He just said... The Lord would speak to you today and tell you that your son is not going to die, but he's going to live and live to preach and prophesy the word of the Lord. And within 18 hours, he would be breathing on his own. That's a prophetic word right there. And it, you go out on that kind of limb, you better, you better, you know what I'm saying, it better be correct. And, uh, and so you see what happened, right? You see what happened. Um. But that was the point where, and I want you to hear this, when you have a report from the doctor, and then you have a report from the Lord, and then the question is, whose report will you believe? We will believe the report of the Lord. And so, and so from there, I love this, by the way. Look at all these youth. I mean, just I'm blessed right there, just looking at all the young people. 
And so you can see within 18 hours, I was breathing on my own and been living that word ever since. And so then, I, then, then the scripture comes to mind, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Man, and I can't get into all that verse, verse 1, 2, 3, it's chat, powerful, but just the one portion of that verse, it says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds, and that word proceeds means ever-expanding. So when God speaks a word, it doesn't just land right here, but it keeps going like the Energizer Bunny and going and going and expands and it gets bigger and greater and more than you could ever imagine. And that's how we live. We don't live on bread. We live on the word. Amen. And so here we are here tonight and we're talking about living on the word. So um, we grew up in an environment and that's why if you see, you see my wife, she's like, she's so excited. She's over at the kids tonight take, you know, in the children's ministry working over there. And, but she's so excited. Like she told people on Sunday, she was like, you know, take, just take, take off work (laughs) and be here, get, be here in every moment. And we're not just saying that so you can just, you know, you know, be at church all the time, but there's something that we're doing where you have like a solemn assembly where you set time aside and you marinate, and you saturate, and it grows, and the anointing increases with every service, every moment, and it's a powerful time. And so one of the things we're doing in Kara's church is we're creating culture, and one of the things we want to be is a prophetic house. And so, so we're going to hand out our notes here on Prophetic House 2.0, and uh, we're going to share with you now on, we're going to basically break off the presbytery. I don't know how much time I'll have at the end, but we might move in a little bit of prophetic ministry and just kind of stir it up. We'll see what happens here. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we're going to have a powerful time. Can somebody just say the word expectation? Come on, say that expectation. Can the young people say expectation? Just let them say it. expectation. Expectation. When you have expectation. It changes everything. Is that right? There's something about expectation. And David said this in Psalm 62. He said, my expectation is from the Lord. And so there is a divine infusion of expectation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Expectation comes by the Lord. He gives us expectation. How many wake up every single morning with a whole bunch of expectation? Not necessarily. How many wake up in the morning with a great big bowl of faith? Not necessarily. We need the word of the Lord to come in and to speak faith into us and build faith into us. And it's the same thing with expectation. And one of the things that God is putting into this house, can somebody, can somebody say yes? What is it? What God is putting into this house is expectation. You want, you, let me give you a verse that, that, that declares expectation. You ready for this verse? I was glad when they said unto me, let's go up to God's house. Whose house? God's house. Let's go up to the house of the Lord. There's an expectation. I was glad. I was happy. There was an excitement. And that's what God wants to put inside of us. And I want to speak a word of expectation for this conference because I believe that God's going to speak to us. When God speaks to, and here's the word I want you to hear, when God speaks to one, he speaks to all. And when God speaks to all, he speaks to one. How many have ever read the the book of Ephesians? The book of Ephesians wasn't written to you. It was written to the church in Ephesus. But how many have ever read of Scripture in Ephesians and said, that spoke to me? Come on, somebody. And so there's a certain point where you realize when you get into a prophetic environment, God could be speaking to Van and Ella, but there's something in the word that God speaks to them that jumps and's like, that's my word too. And so my, my grandfather, who, who his name was Moses Vey, who was my dad's best friend, but he adopted me as his grand. My grandfather, because I did, my grandfather passed before I was born, before, yeah, before I was born. Uh, so he became my grandfather. In fact, I met you with my grandfather 
because he said, can you come with me to Cincinnati to do a prophetic conference at John Stevenson's? And I was like, sure, whatever you want me to do, granddaddy. And so we went, and that's where we met years and years and years ago. And there's something, but he would say this. When you're in a prophetic conference, you got to get, in, in a good way, godly greedy. Okay? And so when the word's being spoken, he would say, reach out your hand. Somebody just reach out your hand. And just say, me too. I'm grabbing that word. I'm taking that word. So he spoke a word of shalom over them. I need shalom. Does anyone need shalom? Shalom in your home, in your comfort zone. Let's look at these notes. And try not to read ahead if you can. The temptation to look ahead. Get out a pen and paper because you're going you're gonna to be writing here furiously. I'm going to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. And I wanted to give notes here tonight so you can take notes and you can mull over this and it'll be online as well and you can listen to it again if you'd like or share it with somebody. It says, For you know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture springs from any private interpretation. For prophecy was at no time brought by a man's will, but men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say moved? Moved, moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, when, when you begin to move in the prophetic dimension, you have to be moved by the Holy Spirit. It's what we call the unction to function. It's what we call the anointing. In the Greek, the word pharaoh is the word moved. It's P-H-E-R-O, pharaoh. And to be moved by the Holy Spirit actually means the Holy Spirit kind of just accelerates you. He pushes you into a place, and so you begin to speak words that you did not even think of before. One of the things I have to tell you, because I believe in prophetic integrity and pastoral integrity, is this, is we're not talking to any of the prophets about anybody up in here. I'm ignoring them right now. And when they come here, we're not saying too much to them. Except for what's up, and I just ask them how they're doing. How's the five kids, Pastor Derek? Tell me, how's Noah? How's Elijah? How's Judah? He has a bunch of prophets in his house. How's, how's Asher? How's, how's Micaiah? You know, I'm going to ask how all your children are doing, but we want to have integrity because we want them to hear from God and not muddy and fuzzy the waters, but get to a point where when God speaks, there's clarity. And when he speaks, we know it's from him, and it's not man-influenced. Somebody say moved. In fact, we all have to be moved by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul uses the same word. He says, in him we live and we move and we have our being. We move. We're moved. So on September 13th to 17th, 2023, Karis Church is entering a new era. Can somebody, can, can somebody just put your name right just on your notes? Just put, my family is entering a new era. Put your name on there. Just write it on the notes. God is about to speak to us in a very profound way through the ministry of the presbytery, through his servants, the prophets, in order. And by the way, you look in the book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, and the scripture says, the Lord God will do nothing in the earth unless he first reveals it to his servants, the prophets. So before God does a thing in the earth, he gives a prophetic download to his servants, the prophets. And so his servants, the prophets, in order to maximize this life-transforming moment, we are corporately and individually getting ready for it. Has anyone ever played in sports? Did you know, you know the morning you got up to go get ready for your game? There was a getting ready? Or you took a test if you were trying to be a good student? There was you got ready for the SAT test? There's a getting ready. Getting ready requires total consecration. Somebody say total consecration. Of heart, mind, soul, and strength. It requires prayer, fasting, and waiting on God. It is what the Old Testament calls a solemn assembly. This is when the body sets apart time to wait on God. And that is what we're going to do between now and the conference. We're going to guard our hearts. We're going to guard our words. We're going to guard our actions, we're going to guard our thoughts, and we're going to guard our time. Is that okay? Why? Because we want to do two things. We want to set the atmosphere for God to come. We want this atmosphere to be pure. Amen? 
And we also are going to set ourselves in order so we may fully receive what God would do next week. Welcome to Vessels 2023. The conference is called Vessels, Prophetic Conference. What is the verse? It's 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Somebody say, I'm a vessel. That the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. You have a treasure in your earthen vessel. It's powerful. Okay, let's do these sections here. We're talking about prophetic ministry. Number one, it's a ministry of divine intention. God has a divine intention. He has an ultimate intention. And God's original intention was in Numbers chapter 11 was that all, somebody say all, all of his people would prophesy. In fact, Moses iterated that in 11, Numbers 11.25, and he said, he said, would that all of God's people would be prophets. What does that mean? That all of God's people would know the sound of his voice. That God speaks to you and speaks through you, and that an entire nation of people would be prophets in the earth. Why in the world will we just have a bunch of prophets in one building? Huh. It's not for the building. <laughs> we gather on Sunday at the fueling station, get filled up. But we are a prophetic company of people who go to work, who go to our neighborhoods, who go to the grocery store. And we are a prophetic company of people whom God is speaking to and speaking through to people and bringing transformation. When Jesus started talking about that you need to go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, he's raising up a company of people who are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll look at this verse later, but you realize that when you look at the intention of the outpouring of the Spirit, there was a connection with prophecy. Come on, somebody. Where he began to speak and he said, this is that that was prophesied by, by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. There's a pouring out of the Spirit, and then what's the next verse? And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So pouring out of the Spirit, God has an intention of raising up a prophetic company of people. Now if you look in, oh, I, here it is right here, actually. I, I, I didn't even look at my notes. Acts chapter 2, there it is right there. It's verses 16 through 18. And if anyone has a problem with women, because someone came up here this last weekend and said, do you believe in women in ministry? I believe in everyone in ministry. <laughs> And you look at the Old Testament where this scripture is first declared, and then you look at the New Testament at the birth of the church. On Pentecost, he makes it very clear. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon on the guys, on the fellas. And unfortunately in the church world, we take one verse and we try to X out the ladies. And the women should be silent in the church. Well, obviously, the way you interpret Scripture, you don't realize in the laws of hermeneutics that there is a cultural interpretation. I can't go over to Nigeria and try and interpret how they do things culturally because I'm not from Nigeria. So how dare I try to impose something that I don't understand upon a people? Oh, okay, I'll stop, I'll stop. But, but the women were supposed to be silent in the church because at that time in that city, in that region, they were not educated and they could not read. And so they were sitting in the, in the service and they were yelling out to their husbands, what does he mean by that? And so they had to make a rule, you know what, do this after church. And if you don't believe me, study it out yourself. But I'm just giving you the breakdown. But you look, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a bone to pick at all. I'm just, I'm just dealing with stuff. But you look and you realize from the inception of the church, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. In the next verse, he says this, and it shall be on my servants and my handmaidens. And I, I use the King James on purpose because those, that language is powerful. My servants and my handmaidens. I will pour out in those days in my spirit and they shall prophesy. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, talking about divine intention. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers and teachers. For the perfect, here's, here's the reasons. We get into this another time. For the perfecting of the saints. 
for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Can somebody say unity? Unity. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded church is unstable in all his ways. Come on, somebody. we got to come to a place of unity. Jesus prayed that prayer in John 17, that they all may be one. Just like you and I, Daddy, are one. Woo! Let the church be one. And I'll tell you, God's doing a work in this time frame. And he says, he says, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, and I love this, this is this a preach, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't know, that sounds bad to the bone right there. I'm raising up a church that is going to be at, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'll leave that alone. I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to preach. So in the New Testament church, God has a purpose. God has a plan. And God has a people. Can somebody say it? God has a purpose. God has a plan. And God has a people. Everything in God's plans come from his purpose. And so when we move in prophetic ministry, the purpose of God, the intention of God is revealed, and then the plan is given, and then the people can be who he's called them to be. Let the church say amen. And so he gave five gifts to the body, the five-fold ministry in this verse in Ephesians. What did he give? You see the hand there? Put your hand in there. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, the apostle to govern. Since you're taking amazing notes, the apostle to govern, the prophet to guide, the evangelist goes out, the finger goes out the farthest, the middle finger to gather, the pastor to guard. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's got a staff. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. The pastor to guard and the teacher to ground. To ground. And each one are important. And one of the major ministries that the church, for some reason, does not understand is the prophetic ministry. The prophetic ministry is a very abused ministry misused ministry. People use it for financial gain. They use it for popularity. They use it. It's not a toy. (laughs) It's not a game. Prophetic ministry is serious. But people use it. And we have these political prophets. And then we have these religious spirit prophets. The political spirit prophets. And they have the religious spirit prophets. And they give the prophetic a bad name. But God's raising up a company of people who understand that the prophets are one of the foundation pieces of the church. With Jesus being the chief cornerstone. So God flips the ministry chart from the five being on top to the five being on the bottom and being the foundation of the church to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Who is supposed to do the work of the ministry? Y'all. Somebody say, me. Me. So what we have to do is we have to prophesy and speak over a company of people and ordain them and release them into their ministries in the marketplace. I believe about maybe less than 1% of people are called to full-time ministry at the church. But 100% of us are called to full-time ministry every single day. And so the prophets, when we refer to Ephesians, are not the prophets of the Old Testament. Can I make this real clear? They're not the prophets of the Old Testament, but these are the recipients of the revelation which has been made known to many generations. And the prophets in Ephesians were contemporaries of the apostles, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers and you look throughout the whole book of Acts and you look at there's prophets like Agabus there's prophets like 
the daughters of Philip. You, Philip is, I got to do Philip sometime. I got to talk about Philip sometime. Philip's so powerful. Well, Philip's right here. And Philip is so powerful. But Philip's daughters were prophes- prophesying in the New Testament. He had four daughters who were powerful prophetesses. And they were speaking the word of the Lord. Let's go to part two. Impartation. So the first question is, what is prophecy? Let's break this down. I'm just trying to ask the obvious questions here so we can get clarity together. There's something about clarity together. You catching what I'm saying? But we all get it together and we all have an aha moment at the same time. So write down Proverbs 15.23. Write it down, Proverbs 15.23. A word spoken in due season, how good it is. Isn't that powerful? Proverbs 15.23. A word spoken in due season at the right time, how good it is. God has a word that is at the right time, in due season for us as a body. Can somebody say, yeah? Yeah. And so prophecy is speaking under the direct supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, the word prophetia means to speak forth the mind and counsel of God. Prophecy is the voice of Jesus in the church. Revelations 19.10, how many have ever heard this verse before? For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I have an eight-hour seminar I do just on the spirit of prophecy, and we literally walk back from Genesis back to Revelation 19.10 on the spirit of prophecy in Scripture because you can see right from Genesis the spirit of prophecy is being released upon God's people. So those who function in different levels of prophetic ministry must understand these basics things in order to properly execute this ministry for the glory of God. So Paul gave the church in Corinth the foundation of the New Test for for New Testament prophetic ministry in one simple verse. 1 Corinthians 14.3. 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, but he who prophesies speaks, somebody say edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. This is not an Old Testament woe unto you, Amon, Woe unto you, Mount Seir. Woe unto you, Girgashites. God's going to crush you. He's going to cause coals of fire to fall upon your head. He's going to destroy your children. He's going to break your teeth. And he's going to to decimate your cities. And you look at all these prophecies in the Old Testament. Anyone who's going around talking like that is not in a New Testament context. Now, At the same time, there are words of warning, and I'm not here to get into all that tonight, but there are words of warning that are administered through people who walk in the office of the prophet. And people who are in the office of the prophet are not self-declarative. They're people who have been recognized and work in a company, and I'll get into this later, but, and that's what we're bringing in here, is people who function in the office of the prophet. And so the off, people who walk, function in the office of the prophet can bring warning, like Agabus in, in, in Exodus. You look, I mean, in Acts, excuse me, Agabus in the book of Acts, where he gives a warning for a city that destruction is coming, and it's a real word, and it was a warning to get out. <laughs> to the people, and it was a timely word. But, but we look in the New Testament, we realize that there are three things that the Apostle Paul lays out that identify prophetic ministry in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. Can we go Greek on us for a minute? The word edification is the Greek word oikodome. And you might have heard me talk about this, but I'm going to say it again. Oikodome. Oikos means house. Oiko. O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E. Oikodome. And it means edification. It means to build up. When the prophets prophesy, there is a spirit of edification that comes into the room. There's a word that comes into the room where you feel built up. The next one is exhortation. Paraclesis comes from the word paraclete, which, by the way, I've officially, I can't help myself, I love it. There's a dove that sits out on the speaker out here. Have you seen our dove? That's our dove, right? That's our dove. 
We have another dove. It's called the Holy Spirit. But I named that dove because I just, I'm like, I, I see it all the time. Like, I start talking to it. What's up, you know, dove? And so I, I named it Paraclete. So our dog, our, 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 it's Paraclesis right here, Paraclete. So that's another name for the Holy Spirit. So when you see our dove, it's Paraclete, okay? We have a church dove. I think it's cool. Paraclesis, P-A-R-A-K-L-E-S-I-S, Paraclesis. And Paraclesis means to encourage. It's the word of exhortation, to console. There's something about encouragement. What if we practice encouragement right now? I want you to find somebody, and I want you to speak a word of encouragement to them. Your hair looks nice. Your smile is nice. You have a nice demeanor. Come on, just encourage somebody. You're going to make it. You're going to do it. Just encourage somebody. Just, this is creating a prophetic environment just by encouraging. And, and sometimes you don't have anyone else to encourage. So like David said in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, David encouraged himself in the Lord. So encourage yourself. Talk to yourself for a minute and just say, you know what, Patrick? You're going to make it. You're going to be all right. It's going to be good. God is with you. You're not alone. If God be for you, who could be against you? Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. And the best way to talk to yourself sometimes is just use the scripture. Hey, Patrick. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Hey, Patrick, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hey, Patrick, why are you so disquieted? Why are you shut up inside of you? Put your hope in God. Hey, Patrick, bless the Lord, oh, your soul, and all that is within you, Patrick. Bless, your, bless his holy name. Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Some people might think you're cray-cray, but I don't care. Talk to yourself. Encourage yourself. David encouraged himself in the Lord. First Samuel chapter 30, he encouraged himself. There's something powerful about a prophetic environment where you're encouraging. The prophetic is about encouragement. There also the word comfort. It's number three, comfort. It's the Greek word paramuthia. P-A-R-A-M-U-T-H-I-A. Paramuthia, just the way it sounds. It means to calm or to persuade. I'm going to stand up in your boat and I'm going to speak a word of calm to your storm right now. God's changing things. He's turning things around. He's causing the winds and waves in your life to be still. He's speaking a word of shalom to you right now. There's a word of peace being released in your life. I don't care what the storm looks like. I don't care what the world looks like. You're going to have peace in the middle of it. You could be in the wildest storm in the earth right now, but you're going to have peace. You're going to be like Jesus. You're going to bring a pillow to the storm. Bring your pillow to the storm. Jesus, the scripture says, had his head on a pillow. We had to preach on a pillow sermon sometime. And just hand out pillows all over the room. What's the guy, his name, My Pillow? We need to get him to just give us a bunch of pillows. Jesus had my pillow. That's be the name of the sermon. My pillow. Shalom in the storm. Peace in the middle of the warfare. He was trying to teach, and then he started to preach. The Hebrew word for the prophetic is naba, N-A-B-A, naba. It means to bubble forth, to flow forth, like a fountain, like a spring, to flow forth, to, to, to spring forth. The prophetic is speaking the purpose of God, the purpose and the heart and the mind of God in the earth. Here's the prophetic real simple. Ready? Verbalizing God's thoughts. Verbalizing God's thoughts. Now let's go from the prophetic. By the way, my wife wanted me to ask you this question. How many in this room have ever received prophetic ministry? Okay. Was it life changing? You remember that moment? Do you remember those words? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The same mouth that said, let there be said hi-ya in the Hebrew, hi, let there be hi-ya, and the universe was formed. It's the same mouth, the same voice that speaks through the prophets. 
and Nabas, it flows forth. And he verbalizes God's thoughts. God's thoughts about you outnumber the sands of the sea. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. They're thoughts of peace and not of evil. Ooh, come on, this is good stuff. They're to give you an expectation. There are thoughts of future. There are thoughts of hope. There are thoughts of life. So let's talk about presbytery. Presbytery simply, this is deep, is a time of prophecy. <laughs> you can write that down. Take it to the bank. Presbytery is a time of prophecy. Let me, let me go a little deeper. Presbytery is when God speaks, and God speaks through prophets. And so therefore, presbytery is a special time set aside by the church that where we invite a prophetic team, can somebody say team, to come in and do what we call the ministry of the laying on of hands, and they prophesy the word of the Lord over lives, cities, states, nations, whatever he wants to do. It's the ministry of the laying on of hands. Write down in your notes Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, let's lay aside the elementary principles which is the doctrine of repentance, salvation, the doctrine of baptisms, the baptisms, which I'm not going to get into right now, but I'll just lay, say them to you, the baptism of water, the, the immersion where the, the old man goes down, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, also the baptism into the body. When you come into partnership, you get baptized into the body. There's a whole scriptures about that. I'm not going to get into that, but a lot of people don't talk about that. And then Hebrews chapter 6, he continues on. He says, and the doctrine of the laying on of hands. This is the presbytery. The presbytery. And then it goes on, and also resurrection life and eternal judgment, which I believe we're stepping into that era where the glory of the Lord is going to come upon the church, where resurrection life is going to be released. But at the same time, when you have the glory of God in a place, there's resurrection life, but you have to be careful because there's also eternal judgment. So let me give you an example from the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira. Lying to the Holy Spirit can cause one to step into eternal judgment. In one moment, Joseph is in prison and he interprets two dreams, one to the butler Eric Butler, and one to the baker. I'd rather be a butler than a baker. Because one, he distributed resurrection life, and the other one, eternal judgment. In three days, you're going to be set out of here, and you're going to be restored back to your place. In three days, you're going to be hanging from the gallows. Because you're a liar. Joseph wasn't playing. What is presbytery? It's when we set aside a time for the church to cause the prophetic team to come forth and to lay hands upon the people and to speak the word of the Lord. Is this okay? Is everyone catching this? And they come with words of encouragement, words of edification, words of exhortation, words of consolation, words of comfort. Can I give you some more words? Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of counsel, words of discernment. This is a I had to condense four and a half hours into about 70 minutes here. These are, I can describe all these things to you, but words of discernment, words of faith. They're going to speak words of faith. They're going to speak words in season, words of healing, words of deliverance, words of placement, where God's going to place you in your place, words of exhortation, words of consolation, words of confirmation, and words of affirmation. We live. This is why I want to get the young people ministered over. This is so important to have you all ministered over because we lived in what we call an unaffirmed generation. And you're, you, everything around you is designed to take you out. And so what we need to do is speak a word of affirmation to an unaffirmed generation. And when you receive affirmation and Abba Father puts his hand on you and says, I bless you, daughter, I bless you, son. I love you. I chose you. I accepted you. There's something that changes in your life and in your heart, and you realize you can know who you are because you know whose you are. 
And so I cannot wait for some of these young people because something's about to awaken inside of our youth group in this house and in our, in our young people. There's a spirit of revival that's going to come. And, you, and, and I recommend all of the other ones, all of us, we better catch on because they're going to be running in a minute. They're going to stir this place up. They're going to stir up this city. They're going to stir up this region. So I'm prophesying the word of the Lord over our young people that God's going to do some mighty things. Can somebody say amen? amen. So presbytery. Let me give you some key verses. Are they on there? First Timothy. Watch this. I just want to give you the scripture behind presbytery. Or the presbytery and presbytery are the same word, by the way. Presbytery is, 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 why we say that is because we hung around too many people from England and Australia. And so they say presbytery, but it, it's really pronounced presbytery. So, so, so it's spelled that way. So, so if you hear me going back and forth, just realize that I've hung around too many British people. And so it just kind of comes out. But, but here's a verse. Look at this. This is a key verse for what we're dealing with. And I want you to catch this. Please stop talking over there. Thank you. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 through 15. Please, please tell them to stop talking. Please tell them to stop talking. They're distracting other people. On the end there, those two. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 through 15. I'm sorry, I'm going I'm to say it like it is, okay? It says, neglect not the gift that is in thee. Can somebody say gift? Yeah. On your birthday, what do people give you? When you go to Christmas morning, what do people give you? Yeah. Gifts. What does God give you? Isn't this powerful? Neglect not the gift that is in thee, watch this, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now all the language that I'm talking is coming together in one verse. Can I read it again? Neglect. What does neglect mean? To disregard, to ignore. Don't ignore the gift. There's a lot of misuse of gift. Don't, and it's dangerous to ignore the gift and to use the gift that God gives you for something other than that's redemptive in the kingdom. Be careful. So you watch Sister Beyonce shaking it all over that stage, doing a seance in the middle of her concert. I'm going to tell it like it is. I said I was going to tell it like it is. And up there, leading a whole generation to hell. Come on, somebody. And what she's done is she's prostituted the gift, Taylor Swift. Prostituted the gift of God that was given to her. And is using their worship anointings and giftings and callings, not just for financial gain, but to lead a whole bunch of people to hell. And so our prayer is not to point the finger, but to pray that she'll come back to her roots, both of them, back to their roots of what they were birthed in from children, and somehow that lie of the enemy, that deception will be broken off of them, and that the truth will come, and they can lead a whole bunch of people into the kingdom versus to hell. Because what your gift is going to do is it's going to do one of two things. It's going to lead people to hell, or it's going to lead people into the kingdom. So he's basically giving a warning here. And he's saying, be careful. Neglect not the gift that was given thee by prophecy with the laying. I could just stop the whole meeting after this. This is just enough right here. With the laying on of hands of the presbytery. And then that's where a lot of people, they, they, they stop the verse, but you got to go to the next one. It says meditate. Not, um, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Meditate is a powerful word. Mary pondered these things in her heart. I love what Pastor Alexander told me yesterday. Mary treasured these things in her heart. The things that Gabriel told her about Jesus that was going to be birthed through her. She treasured. There's something about meditating. Have you ever meditated on something? You meditated on something and it got into your sleep and you're dreaming about it and you're thinking about it. and you're. And no matter what you do, you just keep coming back to it. 
There's something that happens. He's like, this prophecy that is given to you, these words that were given to you, the laying on of hands, the impartation that was released upon your life at the prophetic conference at Vessels, all of a sudden begin to meditate upon these things and give thyself wholly to them. So God says you're going to be a teacher? Then get educated. Get certified. Come on, somebody. Give yourself wholly to what God has spoken over your life. Give yourself to it. Commit yourself to it. And do it in what God has called you to. And he says, and, and, and that thy profiting may appear to all. 2 Timothy 1.6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. And I'm sorry for the King James, but I'm not sorry because this is how I grew up memorizing. So it just makes sense to me. So if you don't mind the, the these and the thous and the William Shakespeare, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, Woo! which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now I want you to see something that's in both of these scriptures. It's really powerful. There was something that took place when hands were laid on you, Paul told the church in Rome, chapter 1, verse maybe around 18, 19, he said, I long to be with you that my, I might impart spiritual gifts to you. Is this okay, this teaching here? I want to impart something. And so what happens is when the laying on of hands, gifts are imparted into you. And so it's not just words. It's also the laying on of hands. And there's an impartation that is released upon you. And basically he's saying this, Yo, Tim, you remember back in the day when we laid hands on you and prophesied you over you at Vessels, prophetic conference? I'm going to remind you to put in remembrance, stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Stir up the gift. Stir it up. Fan into flame, as scripture says. Get that flame going. Get it hot on fire. And then later on in that chapter, he says this. This charge I commit, verse 18 and 19, unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. This is powerful stuff. Holding faith and having a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom Hymenaeus and not Pastor Alexander, but Alexander, whom I delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And the word blaspheme means just literally to insult God. But he looks in the scripture and he says this, I want you to take the words that God gave gave you and to fight the good fight of faith now there's some soldiers in this room and you've seen some combat and you understand what that means and he says i want you to fight i want you to fight a, a good warfare with the word so when the facts come up against you when the enemy tries to come up against you when lies come up against you you have a word that you can pull back and look back at the enemy and say, God said, God declared that my children are going to serve him. God said that my body is going to be healed. God said there's something about fighting a good fight. See, I'm talking, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago and I'm serious. We need to start a fight club up in here. Where some people are just like, you just, you know, I mean, I'm from Oakland, okay? And so Oakland people tend to talk about Oakland. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Oakland. And Oakland people got an attitude, you know what I'm saying? And there's this little, this little Oakland swag, this feel, this flavor. And it's like, when you see somebody else from Oakland, it's like, what's up? You know what I'm saying? There's this, you know, you have this connection. But, but there's something about this connection that we have in the spirit where we fight a good fight and we don't just fight alone but because I was there present and I heard your word 
I can speak your word back to you. Remember what God said? Fight a good fight. You might be discouraged right now, but God spoke and he gave you a word. Can somebody say, yeah? yeah. So in your little blank space, just put this. It's going to be, a, it's a time of impartation. It's a time of placement. And it's a time of confirmation. It's a time of impartation. It's a time of placement into the body. One of the most interesting scriptures to interpret in the New Testament is Jesus when he declares, in my father's house, and this is a funeral verse. How many have ever heard this at a funeral? In my father's house there are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would not have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house there are many mansions. And so all of a sudden we get this whole interesting theology or idea that when we all get to heaven we're going to have mansions. I'm going to tell you right now, heaven is a mansion. But we have this thing, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a zebra, I'm going to have a giraffe in my mansion. I'm going to be able to eat donuts all day and pizza all day and never get fat. Can I get a witness up in here when I get to heaven? We got we to talk about heaven sometime because the, thing, the, the, the doctrine of heaven is so limited even by our interpretation of scripture, let me give you what heaven, let me give you two, two, two ideas about heaven. You ready for them? Heaven number one is more. It's more. So whatever we think it is, whatever interpretations we have of it, is nothing. It's more. And the other, the other interpretation of heaven is this. Are you catching this? Is this all right? The other thing about heaven is this. We have to, if we, if we want to understand what heaven is, we have to first understand what hell is. So hell is not just flames of fire burning forever, screaming and screeching, worms eating your flesh. Yeah, I believe that. I believe it's a whole lot. But hell actually is what Jesus said in John 15. Without me, you can do nothing. So hell, the doctrine of hell is basically without him. And so then we understand what heaven is then. Then heaven is with him. Hell without heaven with. Is that okay? Sorry, that's a sidetrack. Sorry. But we're talking about impartation and placement. Somebody say placement. When you know your place, there's comfort. There's peace. There's life. There's energy. There's clarity. There's function. Imagine signing up for the United States Army. And you're private so-and-so. But you're never given a place. You just wander between the barracks. So what, what, do, you, what do you do? I don't have a place. That doesn't work. Everybody that signs up for the army is given a placement. Let's take the natural idea and bring it into the spirit and into the church and realize that there's an army that's higher than the United States Army. I got two amens, okay. And that's the army of God. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy hill. For great is the army that carries out his word. When the prophets come and prophesy, there's a word of placement. And God says, you're placed in this area. You have a gift of hospitality. You are a, 
a, a doorman in the house of God. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in tent of wickedness. You are a keyboardist. There's a worship anointing that's upon your life. You have a gift with children. There's something when you speak to children, they light up and there's an anointing that's on your life. You, 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 you two, this couple here, your house, when people come into your house, they're going to come into your house and they're going to find Jesus just because you know how to make cheese and macaroni and, and and bake some chicken and, 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 and the way to a man's heart is through his stomach and, and all of a sudden they get into your living room and people start getting saved and prophecies start coming forth. There's an anointing upon you for youth. Placement. Presbytery is about placement and confirmation. And by the way, let me throw this in and I'm going to go to the third part. I'm going to hurry up. The other two parts aren't as long because they're practical stuff. But I want to say this when we talk about presbytery. We believe in team ministry. Not just rogue prophets just going around prophesying. (laughs) Scary. Our church has a culture of teams. Team of teams. More accurately, I believe more accurate and timely words come through teams. Because here's what 1 Corinthians 13 lets us know. We prophesy in part. And we know in part. And so when you get a prophetic team together, each one brings a part. They bring what God shows them. And then the next one stands beside them and prophesies and speaks what God shows them. And you get a bigger picture with the parts of what God's doing in the whole. Somebody catch that? And so, like for instance, I'll give you a scripture, Acts 15, 32. It says, and Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves. This is in Acts 15. Being prophets themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And, 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 and so here we have a team ministering. The great thing I love about this prophetic team here is they don't know you. I'm thankful, I was telling my wife this, I'm thankful that we've been around a little bit now and we're starting to get to know each other. And my prophetic spidey sense sees a whole lot more even beyond what you tell me <laughs> or what you reveal to me. But nonetheless, they don't know you. And, and I love it because, I mean, I've been talking with them and, and, and you know, Jackie and my wife, we, they've been on our text and so you see our communications and they're, they're praying Weeks in advance for this time. They're waiting on the Lord. God's already giving them words for people that they don't have a face for yet. They're getting prophetic words for, for different ones. They're, you're going you're gonna to just come into this room. They're going to look at you and they're going to be like, oh, that's the one. Why? Because God's speaking to them in prayer and preparing them for this time. Which leads me to part three, preparation. How do I prepare In Acts chapter 13, I'm not going to get into all this, but there were certain ones, prophets and teachers, that gathered together, Barnabas and Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up by Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate us, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work which into I called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and, what, laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And so here's the preparation, which, by the way, here you have this multi-ethnic prophetic team. So we're not only neither male nor female, but we're also neither Greek nor Jew. And so here we have, can I speak it up in here? We have an Italian bringing, we have a Jewish prophet. And then we have a prophet from Cyrene. Where's Cyrene? Africa. We have a black man. And then we have a guy from Niger. Niger's a country that still exists in Africa. We have another black man. We got an Italian, a Jew, and two Africans. This is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial prophetic team in the Bible. Everybody in the Bible is not blonde hair and blue eyes. And everyone in the Bible is not Jewish. 
Come on, somebody. God raised up a company of people from every tongue and tribe. And that's what took place on the day of Pentecost. And that's what took place on the second Pentecost at Cornelius' house. Well, all of a sudden, God says, I'm raising up a company of people, and I'm going to have a Puerto Rican prophet, and I'm going to, come on, somebody, and I'm going to have an Arab prophet, and I'm going to have a Jewish prophet, and I'm going to have a Japanese prophet. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm going to raise up prophetic people. I'm gonna, my, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. This is good stuff. Preach, preacher, preach. And so here's, what, here's, here's, here's the points. So I want you to write these down because here's how we're going to prepare. Number one, they ministered to the Lord. I'm going to try and move quickly here, but I want you to catch this. They ministered to the Lord. How, David ministered to the Lord. How did he minister to the Lord? He took out his harp and he began to sing the song of the Lord. Ministering to the Lord speaks of worship. I want you to hear me. This is a good week for you to get into your worship. How many know that we have at Karis Church a thing called Songs of the Season? On YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Music, we have, Pastor Haley and I sat down for a few days and mulled over, praying and asking the Lord, what are you speaking in this moment? What are the songs for this season? And then we sat down and we wrote this, we made this next list for the fall and I think it's a pretty amazing list of songs. There's songs like The Fear of the Lord. There's songs like Is He Worthy? There's songs like, oh, I love this song, Storm All Around You. Go listen to Storm All Around You tonight. It is literally from the book of Revelation. It is apocalyptic, and it is prophetic, and it is powerful. Because by the time you get to the song, they just start singing, all the people in the temple cry glory. All the people in the temple cry glory. Oh, anyway, we have it. So if you need to get it tonight, just talk to one of us and we'll hook you up. Can we put it on the screen even? Can we get, can we get the, the QR code? Okay, we'll put it up at the end. We'll put the QR code. But they ministered to the Lord. Somebody say, minister to the Lord. I will sing unto the Lord a new song. For he has done triumphantly. There's something about worshiping God. I like to worship song, with songs that I've never even heard anybody write. Has anyone ever done that before? Where it's like a scripture just starts coming upon you and just start like, there ain't nobody wrote that song yet, so I'm going to write it. And I can't sing, but God loves my voice. And you just don't know when we get to heaven, actually my voice is going to be calibrated to heaven. And actually the people who can sing on earth, their song, they're going to sound bad. And when I get up there, my voice is going to sound good. And they'll be like, oh my goodness, like, is this Whitney up in here? You know what I'm saying? It's like Luther, is this Luther? Number two, they fasted. We're going to call for a fast, and you ask the Lord how you want to fast. You want to do veggies. You want to do juicing. You want to do whatever. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, next week, we're going to fast to prepare because the conference starts on Wednesday. Some people I know, they keep fasting until God speaks to them. And they might, they might fast through the whole conference. But we're going to fast Monday through Wednesday. If you need to shut off. Well, here's the next one, number three, separate. They separated. Barnabas and Saul separate. So they ministered to the Lord. They fast. Number three, they separated. Shut off Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I don't know if anybody does Snapchat anymore. Snapchat, Twitter. Tweet us this day our daily bread. LinkedIn, CNN, MSNBC, ESPN, Fox News, Home and Garden, <laughs> Food Network, and just look at the look at the at the television and say, "Cayete por favor, I need to meet with God." <laughs> Separate yourself. What if for three days we just didn't get into it? Now, I know you got to work. I know you got to communicate. I'm not saying anything like that. But the extra, instead of doing the extra, set aside the time to pray, which is number four. To pray. To get into prayer. I heard Pastor William McDowell say recently, I think you were with me, Pastor Carlos. 
He said, when you fast, how you do it is the time that you would have been eating, you pray. Just a suggestion, just an idea, just a thought, but I thought it was a good one. And then number five, grow in expectation. So what happens in the presbytery? Here's what happens in the presbytery. We're going to come in here, we're going to pray. We're going to worship. And if you are listening to the songs, then the songs, you already know the songs, there'll be no new songs. One of the reasons we do songs of the season is because we don't need any new songs. There might be new songs for a moment, but the more you listen to them, when you step into here, they're not going to be new songs, and you're going to be able to enter in right away. You, get the, you catch the vision of that? So we're going to come in here, we're going to pray, we're going to worship together. We're going to have one of our prophets share a word, and then we're going to have sets. There's going to be different ones they're going to minister over, and then also they're going to look out and call people out of the audience and prophesy over people. And we're going to saturate. We're going to marinate. The anointing is going to increase in every service. And so I'm going to quote my wife one more time. Don't miss it. And if you know somebody who's not here tonight, help us get the word out. Don't miss it. Because we don't want anyone to miss what God's going to do. We're setting aside this time. This is a special time for God to move in our midst. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So preparation. Another thing I want you to do is I want you to bring a recording device. We're talking practical stuff here. We are going to film the services. We will have private YouTube links later on that you can request for particular services where you got words. But at the same time, I think it'd be a good idea for you to capture it right then and there. So it's okay for you, if you're getting a word, to just be holding and hit record. And if you need help doing that, we can help you out. You go like this, you turn on your phone, (laughs) slide down. Type in voice, and then all of a sudden voice memos come up, and then you hit the red button right here, and it's record. Hey, everybody, this is Pastor Patrick. How are you doing? Thus says the art. So all you do, again, slide down, type V-O-I, click voice memo, and you're good. If you don't have that, we'll help you out. I don't know how many services I've prophesied over people where I'm like, just give me your phone. And I'm just like putting it on. (laughs) I'm sitting there prophesying with a microphone like this. I'm just like, the Lord's speaking to you right now. Is that okay? Number four, last one. This is short. What happens after the presbytery? At the presbytery, you're going to receive a card. If you get a word, you're going to receive a card with instructions. On the instructions, it's going to say, congratulations, we're so happy, we're so thankful for the word of the Lord that's come over your life. Now we want to maximize the word with you. Pastoring the prophetic is very important. There's too many people like Hymenaeus and Alexander in 1 Timothy who got a prophetic word and did not meditate upon it, did not do anything with it, and found themselves shipwrecked. I know too many people who have prophetic words and are shipwrecked. The prophetic word is not for you to be shipwrecked. It's to guide you. It's to confirm. It's to impart to you and release you. But people get shipwrecked. And so we're here to partner with you. This is very important. I want you to catch this. Because we're going to be there while you're receiving your prophetic word, and we're going to be judging the word. Every prophecy has to be judged. It's not the infallible ministry. It's not a perfect ministry. Prophets are humans. They hear from God, but sometimes our wires get crossed and we put our little interpretations in the middle of it. And by the way, when prophecy goes forth, there's going to be some funny moments. It's going to be okay. It's okay to laugh. These guys I'm bringing in are funny. They should be stand-up comedians, but they're prophets. They are hilarious. And it's wonderful. There's going to be moments of emotions where you're going to feel tears. You're going to feel laughter. You're going to feel joyful. You're going to feel tears for other people. You might not even have seen, just seen them across the room. But you're going to be in that moment because when, when the prophetic begins to open up in this place, your prophetic is going to stir up. 
and you're going to start seeing things too. And you're going to be like, when they start prophesying to somebody, you're going to be like, yeah, that's right. Amen. Hallelujah. You watch. It's going it's, it's to happen. It's, it's, it's crazy how it works. And so you're going to be in this room, and it's going to just lift off in this place. And so you're going to receive a card, and what you're going to, the request is going to be is this, and what, you'll see it on the card, to type out your word. We all learn in different ways. And so some of us, we learn by auditory. Some people are kinetic. Some people are visual. You learn in different ways, right? There's other ways, and also typing. We believe in typing out the word, literally word for word. And the Lord said, stop. And the Lord said, you are my chosen vessel. Stop. You are my chosen vessel. Why am I taking so much time to even do this? Because I want you to see there's something powerful that takes place. Because when you type out the word, you're going to send it to us. And we'll have an email for you. It's going to be your email. That's a lot of emails. <laughs> and you're going to send it to us. And then we're going to make an appointment with one of our pastoral team. And we're going to sit down with you and talk about your word. And that's interpretation. And what you're going to find out is, and I told Pastor Alexander this, give me your prophetic word. Because the Lord's gifted me in different particular areas. And one of them is to take people's prophetic word and to interpret to them. And so we'll sit down, and you're going to find out that everything you heard is actually going to be about 10 times more than you thought. Because it's what I call prophecy 2.0. And then what we do is we do interpretation, and then we go to initiation. Because revelation leads to action. You cannot have a, a, a revelation and not do anything with it. Is this okay? And so revelation leads to action. So we're about action. We're about placement. We're about you moving in your place and who God's called you to be. And we're going to start the process of word fulfillment in your lives. Because what God's calling you to do, and I'll end with this, and I speak this over our young people too, is to play a significant role in what he's doing in this hour. Is there expectation in this room yet? Yeah. To play a significant role in your sphere, in your calling, with your gifting, with your anointing. Nobody can do what you do. When you get a revelation of the body, you understand that the thumb can't say to the elbow, I don't need you. That the hip can't say, come on somebody, to the ribs, I don't need you. Each joint supplies. And so everyone is significant. Everyone plays a role. Everyone is essential. Come on, this is good stuff. Pastor Patrick, this is a revelation. This is all I needed tonight. I need to hear this. You are significant. You are crucial. You are needed for what God wants to do in this hour. And God's going to raise you up to play a significant role in this moment. The role that only you can play. The position that only you can stand in. Your makeup, your history, your story, your journey, your anointing is exactly fitted for the place that you are being put in. And nobody else can stand in that place and do what you do. There's no such thing as replace when you are placed in your place. There's a word called forfeit. And I'm not here to talk about that right now. But there's a word called forfeit. And some people can forfeit their place. But we're not talking about that. Because there ain't no forfeiters in this room. Who are fornicators like Esau. Who gave up his blessing and his birthright for one morsel of food. I'm not going to give up my blessing and my birthright for a one night stand. 
I'm not going to give up my blessing. I'm preaching now. And my birthright for one meal. I don't need a biscuit. Cracker Bell's down the road. So I don't need your biscuit. Come on, somebody. There's a certain point where you get a revelation. Ain't no shorty. I'm not giving it up. I'm not giving it up. Only you can fit in your place. And for some reason, in the greatness of the mind of God, because his, 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 his ways are past finding out. They're unsearchable. For some reason, God orchestrated your life and your journey and my life and my journey and their life and their journey to all come into this place called Garrus for such a time as this. And brought us together to be a family. And brought us, I'm, he's preaching now, and brought us together to be a body. To brought, brought us together where each and every one of us supply. And each and every one of us are essential. So we're going to start the process. Starting next Wednesday. I mean, my wife and I, we've been praying for this conference already. I'm just weeping. I'm, I'm weeping over this group right here. I, I'm going to be in here because Pastor Eric's going to be in here. So I'm not going to be able to get into that room, but I'm going to be listening and reading all their words later because God's raising up this generation. It's a Benjamin generation. Benjamin was the last son. And when he was birthed, and I'll stop here. When he was birthed, his mother, she named him. She said, his name shall be called Benoni, son of my sorrow, because she was dying as she was giving birth to him. There's a generation that has been dying as they've been giving birth to this generation, the last generation. And his father said, and that's why the father's blessing is so important. The father said, his name shall not be son of my sorrow. His name shall be Benjamin, Benjamin, son of my right hand, the son of blessing. And so we can misunderstand this generation because later on Jacob prophesied over Benjamin. There's so many prophetic words about Benjamin. Benjamin was the left-handed tribe. Benjamin was the tribe that gave uh, birth to a man named Ehud who was the judge who, 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 who stabbed the king Moab in his belly. His fat belly, the boat Moab, I mean, he, uh, Benjamin was the tribe that birthed a man named Saul, who eventually became Paul. You go on and on, Benjamin. Benjamin, Jacob said about his son when he prophesied over him, when you look in the scriptures in, 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 in Genesis chapter 48 and 49, Jacob prophesies over his 12 sons, and he says about Benjamin, the last son, he says, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. This generation can be misunderstood. Just look at them, they're a ravenous wolf. They're insatiable. They're wild, but they're the son of blessing. And so I weep over this generation. I look at our kids because I got to spend some time with them this summer because we're waiting for our youth pastors to come, and I'm so thankful that you guys are here. But I got to spend a time with the, these young people, and they're so precious, and they're so powerful, and I cannot wait for God to speak over them his words because it's going to shape their destiny. And it's going to set them in motion and they're not going to look back and they're not going to be moved by the things of this world. They're going to be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're going to be like Esther and Joseph in Babylon, but not of Babylon. Lord God, we tonight, we just lift up holy hands in the sanctuary once again. And we thank you for this moment. I thank you for expectation now coming. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. And even as we declare the word of the Lord, preparing for next week, Lord, I pray for expectation to rise. I thank you for our prayer and fasting time, our separation time. Let it be holy. Let no distractions come. <laughs> Lord, we thank you that there's been war. There's warfare that's been happening. <laughs> the water main busted at the church yesterday. And we just laughed because it was just warfare. The enemy doesn't want, he wants to distract, but Lord, we just thank you. We just push back all the forces of darkness, 
all the argumentative, divisive spirits that try to come into our homes, confusion, depression, push it back now. We move into a place of intercession now. We move into a place of prayer. Intercessors, I ask you to pray. We move into a place even for even, even a disruption on jobs and finances be broken right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, that this is going to be a powerful time in you. And so tonight we seal all these words.